Well, the question is simple and yet complex. Did a 92-year-old who disappeared in 2016 simply wander off and have an accident, or did he commit suicide? Some people are even suggesting he may have been assisted by those closest to him. Hey folks, this episode deals with difficult subjects like depression and suicide. So please use discretion when listening if this episode uh, triggers you in any way. If you or anyone you know is dealing with depression or if you're having self-destructive thoughts, please folks, reach out immediately to your medical or mental health provider. There's help available. If you don't know who to call, contact your local law enforcement agency and ask them for help. Now, this episode's rather special because we're going to be exploring who Darwin Hope is right off the bat, what the facts are in this case, and what law enforcement put forth in effort to investigate the case. Then I'm going to pull out a map and explore some possible search areas with Doug Bishop as he prepares to search for Darwin the following day in Idaho. So take a minute, hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so you get all of our notifications. Before I forget, I don't know if you're catching, I'm wearing the new uh, Profiling Evil shirt and uh, it's really got a cool background. It says, uh, see no evil, say no evil, hear no evil. I think you might like it, so please check it out. Now let's dig into this one. Darwin Hope went missing on July 12th, 2016. He was 92 years old and was suffering from depression and thoughts of suicide. You know, within hours of discovering that their father was missing, Hope's sons contacted the Boise Police Department, who pretty darn quickly launched an investigation, mainly because of his age. Now, we're going to learn that they were a little suspicious of the way in which the boys asked the question, of whether it was appropriate and how long you had to wait before reporting somebody missing. Within just two days, though, Darwin's disappearance was on the local news channels and family was sharing information throughout the community. Regardless of their efforts, though, the case really seemed to slow down until about six months later when police interviewed the son separately leaving them with the strong opinion that the police department felt that the sons had something to do with Darwin's disappearance. Hey, we're going to pause for a moment and learn more about Darwin Hope in something that we call victimology. It's this analysis of who Darwin Hope is. Victimology explores the victim's behavior and personality traits. Now, Hope, he's 92 years old, a five foot ten man, who weighed about 185 pounds. In his youth, Hope worked at the Table Rock Cafe in Boise. Table Rock is a real prominent fixture there, the mountain in Boise. But, you know, the, the cafe has since been closed. Now, we're going way back in time. Hope registered for the draft and entered World War II in 1943. He met his soon-to-be wife, Margaret, in England, and the two were married. Now, she immigrated to Boise, where he met her at the train station. Can you imagine how cool that was? And this is where they began their life together. After the war, Darwin, like many World War II veterans, took a civil service job. He took it with the U.S. Postal Service, and he was a letter carrier for 39 years. The couple had four boys, and while they struggled from time to time, they seemed like a pretty happy family. Now, there are some dark secrets there, though. They were There were bouts where alcohol became really disruptive in their life, according to media reports, and some things I've heard the boys say. And there was a uh, this became a point of contention in their marriage, but it sounds like they kind of worked it out toward the end. Now, they started traveling around a little and really enjoying life, but Margaret died early at the age of 76 back in 1989, leaving Darwin alone. Now, that's bringing us up to where we're going to be talking about in this case. And if you're interested in how I gathered so much information about the case, 
uh, or cases that I look into, check out something that we call Truth Finder. The link's down below with a special profiling evil discount code. I like truth finder a lot. It's an affiliate. Now that means I get a small commission if you sign up, but keep in mind, you can cancel at any time. Now let's get back and look at the facts of this case. Darwin number one was depressed and threatening suicide at about the time all this happened. Now Darwin told his sons that he didn't want to live past age 92 and a half. And at the time, that was only about a month and a half away. He, he focused his conversation on different ways in which he could commit suicide, repeating that there was just no point. I mean, this guy had given up. He'd been suffering with some uh, health problems. He had a, a heart problem and he was under the care of a cardiologist. He had this really interesting problem with his groin that was causing him so much discomfort. Now, the night before he left, his son spent the evening with him, trying to talk him down. And when he left, he felt like his father was doing well. And he said his father actually assured him that he'd hang in for a few more days. The son said, quote, dad masked all the pain, close quote. Well, again, think about this. Darwin's health was poor. He, he was just denied some scheduled surgery to fix that groin problem. And the surgery was canceled because his cardiologist hadn't given approval for him to have the surgery. Darwin had given up. He was so depressed over this. And frankly, the guy was depressed living alone. He was 92 and a half and his health was just going downhill. Now, when he disappeared, his sons didn't know how long they should wait. They didn't know if there was a problem or if their dad was just out and spending a long time away shopping or goofing off. He did like to make some trips that were a little longer distance, but usually he could only go about 30 minutes without having to rest. Now, the thing that troubled detectives, though, was that when the sons called, they simply asked, dialing 911, how long do we have to wait before miss, filing a missing persons case? That troubled police. I don't know exactly why, and I didn't hear the 911 call. But it's not really that crazy of a question when you think about it. I mean, if you think about missing person cases over and again, we hear families complaining that law enforcement tells them that they have to wait a little longer. Now, law enforcement is smart enough to escalate based on Darwin's age based on the circumstances. But again, to think that there was something mysterious going on just because they asked how long do we have to wait is a little bit of a stretch. And I got to assume that the police had a little more information to make that kind of a comment. Now, Darwin spent the night at his house after expressing his desire to end his life. And we believe that this is what happened because the clothes that he was wearing the night before he disappeared, the clothes that his son saw him wearing were in his home. That means he wore something else when he left the home. Another interesting thing is his bed was unmade and it appeared like he'd slept in it. So, so there's two things telling us he spent the night there but he got up early and he headed out the door. Now, here's a couple of troubling things, and it could be an artifact of Darwin's depression. It could be pre-planning. Darwin left his hearing aids at the home when he left, along with leaving his cane, something he relied on to walk. And then here was something kind of goofy. Darwin had three wallets, one wallet used for his big money. I don't know exactly what that means. A second wallet he used when he was traveling. Maybe it was a little more secure or something. And a third was where he carried just some spending cash, his driver's license and his eight, uh, his debit card when he'd run around town and grab something over at Walmart or something. When the family went in to look for Darwin, inside his house, they saw fanned out on the washing machine $400. This was really troubling to a lot of people. And I want to just offer maybe two possible explanations. One is he could have been spreading it out so the family saw it and there was no mistake in seeing it. But two, keep in mind it was on the washing machine. 
what if this guy washed the money in one of his pockets or he got wet, uh, something happened that, that caused that money to get wet, and he was actually just trying to dry it out while he dried his clothes? I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Put something down below so we can talk about that one and uh, explore. But what we do know is that he left two wallets behind, and with him, he kept that smaller wallet that he used for purchases, the driver's license and the debit card in it. Now, here's something else that was really interesting. Some of the facts of this case. Darwin left his medicine in the home, and all of his bills were paid a month in advance. So he'd gone ahead and made sure that his creditors were taken care of. Now, Darwin's 2003 silver Pontiac Bonneville was missing that day, and it's still missing today. Dell, uh, right after Darwin disappeared, Dell, his son, a month later filed for conservatorship, and this really upset a lot of people. Conservatorship is where he takes over the legal responsibility of Darwin's finances, his home, his bank accounts, and other things. And again, for some reason, this really upset people, and a lot of ghost stories spun out of control, putting additional focus on the boys because of that. I, I want to just play the devil's advocate for a minute and say it made really good sense. I just went through burying a 92-and-a-half-year-old mother. I took over her finances over a year ago to make sure that I didn't have to do what Dell had to do file for conservatorship, and get a judge to agree that he should have responsibility over those affairs. Now, that house didn't sell for like a year. They didn't dump things. It didn't make it appear that there was any kind of money grab going on. Dell was just trying to take care of his dad's affairs and make sure that everything was done correctly. Makes good sense to me. But law enforcement might know something about this case that we're not hearing about that suggests to them that there was more to it than that. Let's take a moment and talk about the investigation. Now, local police say they searched the boating ramps of nearby reservoirs, specifically one reservoir in, in uh, particular. Now, they said they were unsuccessful. They couldn't find any vehicles near the boat ramps. The family wanted them to search deeper into the water, but apparently there was a disconnect there and they didn't. I don't know the extent of that. Um, the boys were troubled, though, by this idea that maybe they should look in water for Darwin and his vehicle because they said he loved his vehicle. He took really good care of it, and they can't see him driving it into the water. Now, I don't know anything about that, but in looking at this map, I do find something kind of interesting. The boys talked a lot about their dad's love for Lucky Peak Reservoir. And uh, they even recommended that law enforcement look in that area. We're going to come back and talk about that a little bit. But I'd like you to see that area as we look at it here on the map. Six months after this case started to grow cold, police polygraphed the sons. And if I'm understanding the media reports accurately, one of the sons outright refused to take the polygraph. Another was determined to be deceptive on the polygraph, and a third determined to be inconclusive. All this I got, I think if I got it accurately, from the Thin Air podcast. Now, I reached out to them in hopes that I could get them on and get a little clarification there, but they haven't responded to my emails, and I've been trying for about three months. Now, the boys denied any knowledge of their dad's disappearance. In fact, they were pretty darn angry when they found out police were looking at them as potential suspects. They had gone so far as hiring a helicopter to fly over the area and look for Darwin's vehicle. Now, after six years, I want to just make this really clear, nobody has stumbled across the vehicle in the woods or the surrounding areas. Now, think about this. Darwin could only drive for about 30 minutes at a time. And when he did go somewhere, he had to stop and rest because of those physical ailments he was going through. 
In addition, there have been forest fires in the area. And of course, there's been six years of hunting seasons. And we just saw records in Idaho just a few weeks ago where hunters last year found a man that had been missing 50 years. Hunters are finding bodies all the time. And keep in mind, there's six years of people traveling those back roads. And Darwin left in a vehicle, not a truck, but a passenger car. So that thing's not going to go very far on the back roads. It's going to stay on some pretty well-groomed dirt roads if he gets off-road at all. Now, media reports also suggest that police thought that one of Hope's sons might have even gone as far as dismantling their father's vehicle and burying him and the vehicle in a large lot behind the family business. When they suggested this to police, the son became angry and responded that they didn't need a search warrant to search his business. They could go over there right then and there. Well, I'm unsure if they ever did go search or if that bluff, or at least that very firm statement, was convincing enough that they changed their investigative angles. Now, this is the kind of case where finding the vehicle in the local terrain has failed. It appears that there have been plenty of time for somebody to stumble across the vehicle and uh, registering the car with the National Crime Database would have revealed if that thing had been seen anywhere else in the country. Well, hey, folks, I'm pausing to share some concerns I have surrounding identity theft and fraud. I've learned a lot from our partner, Ara. They're the pros at protecting people from cyber predators. Aura provides identity theft protection, credit and fraud protection, and online and device security for you and your family. They taught me to think twice before answering those online questionnaires designed to steal our personal information. You know, it must be working because U.S. statistics show that 33% of us have been victimized by identity theft at an annual cost of more than $56 billion each year. Aura protection plans come with around-the-clock support, a money-back guarantee, and a million-dollar theft policy. But here's the best part. You can try Aura for free by clicking on this special Profiling Evil link in the description down below. When you do, we get a small commission. But think about it. You insure your car and you insure your house. Don't you think it's time to insure your identity? Now let's get back to today's discussion. I want to take a moment and explain polygraph examinations to you. There's always a little bit of misunderstanding in this. The polygraph machine, uh, a lie detector, is designed to detect and record changes in physiological characteristics, things like a person's pulse or their breathing rate. Think for just a minute about the response that you have whenever you're under a lot of pressure. Some people start sweating. Others might get a red neck. Each one of us are different. And that means that the examiner has this tremendous responsibility to really watch the individual and to ask questions that can be measured. Some of the questions are what we call control questions, things where we know the answer, like, is the sun shining today? Then there are questions where we don't know the answer. And it's the response that the subject gives that's measured physiologically that tells us the difference and gives us a sense of whether something is right or wrong. The examiner can measure the physiological response from that information and then theorize about truthfulness backed by science. Now, inconclusive results can happen when there is no measurable difference in the answers. doesn't mean somebody's lying. It just means that, that it's not a good test. Now, I do find it interesting that one of the brothers declined to take the polygraph. But again, I'm not going to send up smoke signals and claim that somebody's guilty. It could be this guy didn't like law enforcement, didn't trust law enforcement, didn't trust the investigation. Maybe he was frustrated with the investigation or he thought that the entire thing was a waste of time. 
He might be the kind of guy who has heard that polygraphs aren't admitted into court because they're not as reliable as other sources. The thing that is clear from media reports is that the investigators tried to get the brothers to turn on each other, but those brothers held firm that they had nothing to do with Darwin's disappearance. Now, I don't want to leave this case and this discussion on the case without saying that it still is possible that Darwin's sons had something to do with Darwin taking his life, something to do with assisting him, but it just doesn't seem probable to me. I reached out to the brothers and didn't get any of them that would reach back and talk to me. So I'm left wondering if they would participate in any way that wouldn't allow Darwin to be properly buried. I mean, they still loved their dad. They knew that their mom wanted to have her ashes mixed with her dad, their dads, and those ashes spread at that train station where she immigrated from England back to Idaho. I find it really difficult to believe this, frankly, that they were trying to assist him. I mean, if they were, why not do something like pills or making it appear that he died in his sleep? I mean, nobody would have questioned a 92-year-old with poor health dying in their sleep. To consider this possibility, I would want to know a whole lot more about the family dynamics, each of the boys individually. Frankly, if this was a money grab, and again, I don't think there's any indication to support that theory, why would they then destroy the vehicle, which would be worth some money? The case really points to Darwin hiding nearby, probably underwater. Now, knowing that Darwin was only able to drive about 30 minutes at a time, that limits the area where the AWP team might concentrate. Re regardless, this is just plain a needle in a haystack. I I've mapped out that community, and, and you can see that there are a number of lakes and streams and canals in the area. So let's just take a minute and look at that. So here's the area in the Boise, Idaho a part of the United States, uh, the area that we're talking about, the, the big round circle in the middle, this point is Darwin's residence, is uh, the Walmart store. And we know that Darwin liked to go to Walmart. In fact, the boys thought that perhaps he did go to Walmart shopping. And that's why part of the reason behind them making the call to law enforcement and saying, how soon is too soon to report an incident like this? As we look at this case, there's a couple of things that get pretty interesting. Number one, I want to just explore a couple of locations that really jumped out. You can see this river running through the area here leaves all kinds of possibility for places where Darwin may have disappeared if he were to go into water. There were a couple of uh, areas that I thought were kind of interesting. Number one is we cannot discount the area where the sons say their father liked to go. It's Lucky Peak Reservoir. And here at Lucky Peak Reservoir, there were a couple of things that I thought were pretty interesting. As I've looked at some of the areas that I think are kind of intriguing, again, we know that uh, according to the boys, that law enforcement checked the boat dock area. But look at how many areas where the road runs really close to the water line. Places that potentially a vehicle could go off the road, either accidentally or on purpose, and uh, put the driver in real jeopardy. You'll notice this road goes around many of the fingers of the lake really quite closely. So again, I think there's a lot of area that's really interesting here. As we look further to the north, though, look at this river that's running here and how close that is to the road. I think all of these areas, especially because this river is dammed and prevented from uh, getting too shallow, uh, I assume because there's a little bit of an electrical station right here, uh, this weir somehow is creating a lot deeper water, water that potentially could hide a vehicle. So... I think that, that it might make sense to look at some of these areas where the road draws much closer to the edge of uh, the water. And I'm going to just indicate those in a couple of places. In this area here, uh, of course, all across that dam area, 
uh, some of these areas that are really interesting where waterways and road are really close together. But this is really intriguing to me where the river and the road run so closely together between here and that dam really makes for some interesting discussion as we look at this. Now, if we were to go further north, another area that the family has suggested might be interesting and frankly, a place where Darwin liked to go was up to Black Canyon. And there again, there are a number of locations that might be really interesting, places where the road uh, runs very closely to the water. And those are the kind of areas where an individual could go into the water pretty darn easily and uh, disappear. So uh, depending on how that water looks when it's the, when the water is uh, uh, high versus this time of year when the water's really dropped down, it could create some interesting areas, all kinds of areas that are really intriguing just because the road happens to pass nearby. Another place that I thought was really kind of interesting though is here at Deer Flat and Lake Lowell. And if we zoom into that area, again, I don't know how deep Lake Lowell is, but there's a really interesting area along here that might be worth taking a look at. Again, I don't know how deep this area is here, but uh, those those are really interesting areas to me. And here we see that it's really quite a small area outward from Darwin's house, knowing that these other locations are within reach. So I wanted to take a moment and just look at that from a drive time perspective to see what that might look like, to give us a sense of where Darwin might potentially travel. And as we go in here, we can start to fiddle around with this a little bit, look at different options for making that trip up into this area. We can see these drive times going from 54 minutes down to 42 minutes. Uh, we, we really don't see a lot of difference. So we, we know that, yeah, par probably within range of what Darwin could have handled. So using that same mindset, let's go from Darwin's house down to Lucky Peak Reservoir. And we can see that there are a couple of options again there that, that are kind of interesting. But here we have a 25-minute drive. If he goes more along the river, it increases to 32 minutes. But each of those provides some really interesting locations that the team could look. And then finally, if we were to take that same location and uh, go out to the west... We still that see that drive time now is about 47 minutes. So all of these create some really interesting challenges. The first is a swipe map that gives him the ability to get down into the area a little closer and look at the map either as a uh, aerial image or to look at it in a number of different ways. Maybe it would be to look at it as an aerial image versus let's go here and just look at a topographic map. So now we have just strictly terrain and the area that we're looking at. So kind of a nice way of looking at it. Now, in the meantime, take a moment and weigh in your thoughts on the case. I mean, here's the questions. Do you think Darwin Hope committed suicide or did this guy have some kind of a terrible accident right at the time when his mo emotions were, un were compromised and he was threatening suicide? And I want you to think about the three bodies of water that we've discussed, including that big, long sliver of river. Now, which do you think holds the greatest chance of being the place that Darwin Hope may have been hiding for the last six years, if in fact he did go into the water? Well, don't forget to respond to the comments made by other viewers and know that I'm going to be reading everything that you've got to say. And I hope you'll sign up for our channel membership. So please stop right now and hit that like and subscribe button. And ring the bell so that you get all of our videos. And folks, stick around for three minutes to hear that little trailer on Murdering Betty. I think you're going to enjoy Mapping Evil with Mike King. Share Profiling Evil with your friends. And remember, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you like podcasts, not only Mapping Evil, grab Profiling Evil on your favorite podcast platform. And please... 
Check us out on the World Wide Web at ProfilingEvil.com. This podcast contains detailed descriptions of violence and murder and is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. 19th of September, 1952. There's been a shocking sex murder at Wilston. 400 police are now involved in a major murder manhunt. This is season two of Mapping Evil with Mike King. This was this beautiful, low-risk woman murdered and left on the side of a road, thrown over a fence and into a backyard. When I saw the body, I realised just how horrible the whole thing was. She'd been kicked or bashed so hard on the side of the face that one of her teeth had dislodged from its socket, emerged through the cheek on the other side of her face and landed on the grass. I'm Tori Shepherd, journalist and true crime enthusiast. And in this podcast series, Murdering Betty, we delve deep into Queensland's most gruesome and longest-running cold case. It would appear from the partial undressing of the body and from the position in which the body had been placed that the objective of her assailant was to make a sexual attack but that he had been thwarted in some way. In this four-part series, we take you on a suspenseful quest. Who could have committed such a spine-chilling, brutal killing on that fateful Brisbane night? My dad killed Betty Shanks. This predator couldn't have come out of this unscathed. He likely would have blood all over him. There's evidence like blood transfers on the top rail of the fence that support this theory. We'll take you to the crime scene and reveal that beneath one of Australia's most shocking murder mysteries lies a vital geographic footprint. There are three primary sites that we're going to look at as we talk about crime scenes. So if you're asking yourself if the geography really matters, I think absolutely. There have been so many theories and suspects over the years. The doctor who committed suicide two days after Betty's death, the soldier on the motorbike, the handyman that was supposedly having an affair with Betty. And on that night, a taxi driver named Murray Templeton picked up what he described as a well-built, tallish man near the Newmarket Hall. The first thing I noticed was that he had blood on his clothes and face. He gave me the impression that he wanted to get away from the locality as soon as possible, giving me the directions as he got in. And then there's the mysterious man in a brown suit who was seen loitering at the tram terminus where Betty was last seen. It was the man in the brown suit who very likely killed Betty Shanks. Betty Shanks. And our world-renowned criminal profiler extraordinaire, Mike King, has uncovered a new lead in one of Australia's coldest cases. I've been examining the Betty Shanks case since 2019, and the most peculiar thing happened. I was contacted by someone willing to share relevant information about this murder. Joe murdered Betty Shanks, and I raced into my wife, and I said, he did kill her, he did kill her, there's no other answer. It's been 70 years. Do we finally have an answer to who killed Betty Shanks? Coming to you soon, Murdering Betty, the true crime podcast series Mapping Evil with Mike King.